Hey everybody, uh, it's time for me to do this uh, Ask Me Anything AMA uh, video. I've been putting it off for a while, thinking I'd get to it, you know, any minute now. Uh, I didn't get a huge number of questions, but I got some interesting ones, so I'm just going to go through them one by one and uh, answer them, and hopefully uh, this will be a, a good start for, you know, opening up more of this sort of thing, and uh, we'll get hopefully a few more questions next time. Uh, so, uh, let me go through and start with, uh, Patreon people, and then I'll go to Twitter and Facebook questions, um, and then, uh, after this, I'll put out another, uh, pretty soon another, uh, you know, offer to do another AMA and catch up on what's going on with Marlin and with, uh, that sort of thing, 3D printing in general, I guess. Uh, uh, coming up is, of course, uh, East Coast Rep Rap Festival is in June, and I'm going to be doing a, a keynote talk, which I guess basically means uh, welcoming everyone and uh, talking about the state of the art with Rep Rap and what's going on in the scene and uh, trying to bring everyone together around uh, what's coming up in the future uh, for Rep Rap and 3D printing and uh, the maker scene. I'm pretty excited about what's happening now. We're moving on to 32-bit boards. We're getting more intelligent printers. Uh, things are in a, you know, in the price point of around five, you know, certainly under a thousand dollars in the five hundred dollar range. Now have you know filament sensors and uh, I guess what you'd call power loss recovery. Although there's some issues with that, which I can talk about in a future video. Uh, but for now, let's just get into. Uh, questions. So first question comes from Edward Coe who asks, are there any plans to integrate additional axes? Uh, he's set up to use a second extruder to control a fourth axis, but it ties up one of his MOSFETs uh, for a non-existent heater and forces him to disable ther thermal runaway protection. So actually uh, what's coming up is there's actually a pull request now for the hang printer and that uses uh, another linear axis to control the motion of that hanging uh, effector. So that's actually in the hopper right now, and that is one of the, it's actually the first uh, feature that I've seen that integrates another linear axis. So that's really cool. So basically you would use your E0 plug would become your next linear axis, or maybe if we know that you have uh, you know, three linear axes and an extruder, maybe the next uh, extruder would become that linear axis. So I've got to set it up to automatically configure that. But once that's in there, then it shouldn't be a big leap to add another axis that's linear or that does something else. And basically we'll just give it another letter, like it'll be, you know, G1, X, Y, Z, Q or something. I'm not sure, but we'll figure out what letter that should be. So that's, uh, that's definitely a possibility. and. Um, and I'm pretty excited about what's going on with motion stuff in Marlin in general, so I think that's going to be a good addition. Uh, Murphy Pan asks, what is your opinion on combining race with veganism? Well, I did say ask me anything, so uh, I am a, I am a, a non-meat eater vegan, I have been now for about 13 years. And uh, what is my opinion on combining race with veganism? Uh, sometimes vegans will, in rhetorical flair, talk about uh, comparing uh, feedlots to concentration camps and the conditions that animals are kept under to uh, deplorable conditions that humans have had to put up with, and they'll compare uh, slavery and the use of animals in agriculture, and uh, I think a lot of, there are a lot of definite parallels in these things. Uh, which I could get into, but I won't in this AMA. <laughs> uh, maybe if I do a vegan AMA, I'll get more into it. But uh, my feeling is that, you know, there's uh, definitely we can treat each other better. And that's, that's uh, each other in terms of us and treating other species better, treating other people better, treating anything or anyone that we consider different from ourselves. Uh, we should, you know, should strive to find the commonalities and we should strive to treat everyone and every being with utmost respect. So I would say if there are issues with people being oppressed because of their minority class being a, a different race from the majority or 
because they are weak and you know uh, in a weakened position like animals are who can't really organize and defend themselves and and petition Congress for redress of their grievances it's up to every person to try to stand up for the underdog and to try and uh, see that justice is achieved and you know we should always be striving for greater justice and so you know my veganism is definitely based around a lot of that so uh, and you know also being an engineer I think that you know it's you you don't want to put bad stuff in your engine and uh, that the same reason I don't want to put bad stuff in my body so I've just opted out of animal fats and too much protein and I've just opted for a plant-based diet and, you know I think that's a, a good way to go and it also it fits with my uh, interest in, in Buddhism and in meditation. I just find that my yoga and my meditation are generally uh, way better when I'm eating light and eating low on the food chain and treating beings with respect and not having that baggage carrying around, feeling like I'm I could be doing better, you know. So and we can always be doing better. So that's a good. It's an engineering thing and it's practical, but it's also very much uh, you know it definitely go, it is a heart felt thing as well. Uh, so anyway, that's the last question on that subject. Uh, now on to more Marlin questions. So uh, Per Buer has a couple questions, actually three from Per Buer. So uh, we're going to get straight to those. Uh, we have, first of all, with so many commercial entities using Marlin, are any of these companies contributing to development, uh, either through code or through monetary contributions? Uh, my Patreon, of course, which is where these questions come from, uh, does get me some money, um, but he says it's nowhere near enough to sustain development. Um, and it's true, uh, uh, I mean, uh, an awful lot of development comes from volunteerism. My part started out as pure volunteerism, just contributing what I could, and then I started the Patreon just because it was eating up such an inordinate amount of time, and I ended up doing a lot, uh, and as I've gotten more involved with the project, I do a lot more um, custodial work, maintenance, uh, making sure that every pull request that comes in is um, cleaned up and adapted and just made as you know, uh, compliant with the way we do things in Marlin as possible. And so, uh, you know, for my part, um, my Patreon is there to sustain uh, just my own personal efforts and to let me spend as much time and focus as much attention as I can on Marlin. Um, and there are a couple of contributors who are companies um, who I could mention. Uh, you can go on Patreon and see who they are. Uh, but uh, one for sure is uh, Aleph Objects has been a big supporter. Um, and there's uh, a couple of others. Um, uh, there are certainly some uh, individuals who are giving an awful lot, which is like amazing to me. Uh, I hope that they're using their 3D printing to do really amazing things and that it's profiting them as well. Uh, you know, because this is, uh, it's very much, uh, for me, it's as much uh, an avocation as it is a, vac a vocation. I got into this for all kinds of reasons, but uh, primarily because I really wanted to get away from the desktop-based software development that I'd been doing and get more familiar with um, these microcontrollers, with robotics, with the physical realm where you don't make all the rules, you know, you have to adhere to physics and this has taught me a lot about the limitations of machinery and what you have to do in trade-offs between, like, you can't just idealize and have, you know, the, the firmware could move at a million miles a second, but the physical objects aren't going to do that and, you know, so you have to work within these limitations and learn to work with the reality-based um, aspects of it and it's sort of uh, for me definitely been an extension of my engineering education and my engineering career which I I guess I never realized I was supposed to be an engineer I thought you know I was much more romantic and artist and I wanted to do music and, uh, and art and uh, I did that for a period of time and web development was sort of sort of a, a mixture of software and design coming together um, but with 3d printing it was like uh, you know it's a, it's a huge uh, like there's just a, such a huge realm there of creativity crossing over with engineering, crossing over with software, crossing over with just everything, the maker scene and of course uh, STEM education and the STEM uh, world and I should say the STEAM, he 
because art is important uh, as important as anything. Um, but uh, not to get too far away from the original question, but yeah, the the basic uh, what's sustaining it is yes, there's these contributions that I get through Patreon and occasional donations from other sources. I get a lot of donations of equipment, which have been extremely helpful, and especially getting the 32-bit development started and, and moving that along. Um, and uh, as I get more contributions, I want to do more like bounties and uh, basically offer payments for features that are in high in demand or need, or you know, just tasks that need serious refinement so that people can put more time and effort into it and not feel that they're um, sacrificing too much of their time for too little of reward. Uh, so I, I certainly encourage everyone with creative interests to, uh, who like to make things and do daily creativity uh, to take a look at you know, using YouTube, using social networking, using Patreon and GoFundMe to uh, find your audience and find your community and find your patrons and find your support and just build around you know keep building on what you do because if, i mean if you're not doing what you love then you know you, it's it's sort of like you shouldn't spend too much time hating what you do you got to really get into what you do and find and find the creativity in it i was i was just personally burned out on web development um because as a software developer i started young and i've been doing like i really like real time programming games and dynamics and sort of that real-time interaction and with the web it was like I had very little opportunity to do that and a lot of it was about just uh, refinement and really going over a lot of the same ground a lot and I just was like I needed to get into some new ground so I really appreciate being able to use uh, the skills I learned like JavaScript and so forth to make cool stuff on the website for Marlin uh, and to improve things there uh, I, I mean, JavaScript's a great language. Everyone should, you know, learn a little. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, for for me, it was like you know this this extension into the wider world of of engineering and dynamics, and certainly with three D printing, it's just uh, that's that's a whole world that I'm just really coming to appreciate a lot more, uh, thanks to my involvement with this. And I wouldn't have been able to get nearly as deeply involved if it hadn't been for starting the Patreon and asking for help to sustain my attention. Uh, I was trying to get jobs in things like creative coding, but those are few and far between, and you have to sort of fit into a culture, and there's uh, a lot of corporatism involved in some of that stuff, and it was just, that wasn't the area I wanted to go into. Um, uh, so being able to do this sort of for the community and in an open source venue is really exciting, because I just love doing open source. Uh, and I'm going to do uh, a lot more of it. Um, so, Per Buer's next question is, uh, the difference between CPUs and microcompo microcontroller MCUs? Uh, as someone who's not very familiar with microcontrollers, who's played with Arduinos, I find it very interesting that tasks like 3D printers are still considered completely unsuitable for proper CPUs. I understand that CPUs typically involve operating systems, and most operating systems have a very hard time giving real-time guarantees. Of course, with faster processors, it's getting better. Uh, perhaps you can talk a bit about the difference between what most of us uh, know, CPUs, and what is lacking in order to have CPUs power devices like 3D printers. Uh, is it purely a software problem? Would a special purpose OS be a suitable platform for a 3D printer? Uh, and then a comment, I guess CPU would be able to use other language runtimes. I've seen some rants about C++ that would potentially lower the bar for contributions. So of course, um, what I can tell you about the difference from my perspective is with, of course, with operating systems, you're typically um, working within, say, an application environment. You open a window and then you have a screen and you're dealing with um, events from the mouse and from the keyboard and these things come in and it's sort of a whole ecosystem uh, that's already there. With a microcontroller you have maybe the Arduino routines and then you have pins that you can twiddle and turn on and off and you have some that can read analog, that take analog inputs and turn them into digital values which you use routines for to do that and, a lot, and all of the stuff that you do uh, at the when you're programming um, a, a microcontroller is 
you just think about a lot more at the lower level. You can get libraries where, like uh, UAG Lib, for example, for driving graphical displays, where you don't have to think about all the aspects of driving, you know, drawing each pixel. And those are, but uh, you know, and those are handed to you, and you have the code. The code tends to be a lot smaller than you would find in typical OS routines because you're dealing with a, a smaller realm, uh, 128 by 64 monochrome screen, for example, is a lot simpler to drive than you know all the many displays and things and devices that typical OSs drive. But uh, I'd say that. Um, of course, we're working with 16 megahertz CPUs, which are pretty slow. That's about the speed of an Amiga uh, 2000 computer, maybe, or an Amiga 3000, I suppose, uh, from the, you know, the mid-80s. Uh, of course, they're a RISC architecture, so it's from mid-90s is when this was developed, uh, the AVR processors. Um, and they're, uh, you're dealing with, for example, moving stepper motors means uh, turning signals on and off really fast, uh, but not too fast because if you do it too fast, the stepper drivers can't keep up with the signals, and you're dealing with everything on the level of signals pretty much. Something's turned on, something's turned off, and you get a lot lower level, and you think a lot lower level about that sort of stuff. Um, I would say that, of course, now we have things like Clipper coming out where you're using a Raspberry Pi, which is a Linux computer, to do a lot of the heavy lifting of um, producing the um, simplified control codes that are then sent to a simplified firmware that doesn't have to do as much uh, of the work, uh, but it still runs on a separate board. So you'll have Clipper running on, a, a say, your Raspberry Pi, and maybe you'll even have um, Octoprint running on the same Raspberry Pi, possibly. Um, and then the printer is really doing a lot less processing, so there's a lot of extra overhead there. Um, we talk about real-time operating systems as part of the embedded world and what these are is just basically a framework that's built with timers, with usually with hardware timers, and a scheduler that makes sure that things get executed at the right time. Uh, with Marlin, for example, we handle all that within Marlin. There's not uh, necessarily a timer and scheduler system, it's just we, when we need to have something that that ha turns on like servos or the steppers or temperature checks to check all the temperature sensors and other sensors we just turn on a timer and connect a routine to it and then write the routine and then if it needs to be added on we just add on to that routine so there's stuff that needs to be done not as often as stepping the steppers that's usually in the temperature uh, timer handles that and then there's like the servos they don't need to move too fast so there's a separate timer that can be attached to servos to, to move them when they need to be moved. Um, so, you know, that's sort of, the, you're a lot closer to the hardware, and that's, that's the thing that you don't get with operating systems. Uh, there, were there was times when you could skip the OS, uh, even like say on the Amiga, for example, which has uh, the workbench and the kickstart and all that sort of stuff was the operating system. And then uh, I think it was called Enlightenment or Intuition. I think was the name of the OS. And you could actually just uh, buy once you've loaded up your program, you could bypass the entire OS and go straight to the hardware. And with game systems, that's typically how they work um, because you want to have the fastest performance. With desktop OSs, you want to have uh, nice interaction with other applications without messing with them and without stealing too much of their time. So there's a lot more considerations that you have to make when dealing with operating systems than you do with 3D printing and with microcontrollers and stuff like that. So um, I would say that uh, a CPU, yes, would be able to use other language runtimes. I mean, there are embedded controllers now that run Python um, and that Adafruit is really excited about. And the, there are different ways of doing that, but we write uh, Marlin in C++ and in C and some assembly language where things really need to be speedy and optimized and taking advantage of the powers of these AVR boards which are you know slow by today's standards but certainly fast enough to keep up with typical Cartesian printing and even with deltas uh, if, you, if we're careful to not use up too much time for things like the display so there's a lot of cool stuff going on with um, 
you know, on the AVR, but it's definitely, we're, uh, we're tending to invent things and make them as much from the hardware ground up as we can to make it as performant as we can. And we're always looking for optimizations. And I think that for me, I've, it's kind of ideal because I started programming in like 78 on like the Atari and, and, with, and with these computers where you only had a small amount of memory and you only had a certain number of cycles to make uh, a game run well and be performant, you had to really learn to optimize and write assembly sometimes and just figure out ways to save a byte here and a cycle there. And I kind of I enjoy that process uh, at periods. So it's like, it's kind of cool to be working on systems where I get to think at that low level and find those uh, tricks and, and ways of getting them to perform better. Uh, so uh, that's, I guess that answers most of that. Um, let's see, then his, que his next question is just uh, experience with C++ good and bad. Uh, Marlin is, as far as I know, written in C++, yep. And a lot of C, it's very C-like C++. Uh, can you talk about your experiences with C++, what has caused grief, what works? Also, C++ has been changing substantially over the last couple of years. C++ 17 is a different beast compared with C++ we all, we've all been raised with. <laughs> well, we haven't all been raised with it, but um, yeah, for those of us in coding, we have watched C++ evolve. And I used it uh, initially with OpenGL and, like, um, and writing my uh, fret pet which was a, a desktop application. And uh, that was like my first experiences with it. And then I used it to write like my Wacom tablet driver, open source driver, and also other mixtures, C, Objective-C, and other things coming all together. Uh, C++ uh, 20 is coming soon, uh, or at least the standard has been, is being finalized. Um, and so there's, you know, there aren't a lot of, uh, and maybe no compilers that actually adhere to everything even in C++11 yet. So, you know, but we've just started using C++11 features in Marlin, which is great. We are able to do that. And some of that includes things like uh, the const expression idea, which is anything that can be determined at compile time, um, like if you're not using variables and so forth. Or even if you are, you can use vari variables in a sort of a temporary state, as long as you know what all the values that are coming into it are going to be. And it's not a runtime thing. You can actually have whole functions that are handled at the pre-compile stage and that just um, and do things that are related to the pre-compile stage and don't end up necessarily in the final code, which is kind of interesting. So you can do things like uh, static assert, where you can check conditions that you couldn't check with the normal uh, if def and things like that, which are precompiler directives. So there's some cool things we can do, like making sure that values are within ranges or that you know something isn't. Uh, you know, it, we can actually deal with floating point numbers, which you can't do in the precompiler and stuff. So there's some nice things about that that have been coming along in C++. Um, I'm trying not to use too much C++ because there was this whole concept. At least when I started on, I, I was thinking a lot about what's called embedded C++ which is meant for microcontrollers and which throws away some features or sacrifices some features of C++ for the sake of performance. Uh, and uh, my feeling about that was uh, that we should try and, yeah, definitely keep it as lean as possible. And a lot of um, Marlin, well, initially it was borrow, uh, parts of it came from Gerbil, parts came from Sprinter and parts came from just various places. Some libraries like the SD fat library and stuff were actually incorporated and then modified within Marlin. And a lot of that stuff is just straight C. So uh, what I've tried to do is bring that into, uh, so to encapsulate some of that in C++ classes to, for some of the uh, syntactical benefits, but then not mess up the performance by having everything be pointer based where, um, you know, you're passing an extra parameter to every function call basically in C++ when you use uh, classes and objects. So instead it made like what are called static singletons. And so the classes are static, which means when you call those functions, they're called just like C functions, no extra parameter, there's no object associated with them. Everything is class, is in the class and not in the instances. So you can think of, you can think of it like, um, the idea is you, you can make multiple objects, but they all share the same variables. They will, uh, and so if you modify one or call one, you're basically calling all of them, or calling you know 
one affects the same. Uh, so there's like this. That's the idea of having a singleton. So I've tried to just basically use C++ to encapsulate things. Uh, you could also use what's called namespace, but I find those messy. It's, I think it's nice to be able to have an instance and use dot notation and not have to think about the classes that it's in or the way it's encapsulated or the namespace it's in. You just use the name, say planner dot do this, and it'll just do call the planner and it just creates a nicer, a slight, somewhat nicer syntax. Uh, I mean, you could use planner underscore and just have functions, but I just find that it's nicer to, to use statics and static classes and, and encapsulate things that way. And, and the dot notation is familiar to people with like Java or other languages that use dot notation, C sharp, and so forth. Um, so uh, at the same time as I'm trying to keep it very low level and performant like C, uh, I'm also looking at making sure that it has some C++ goodness and that we can, you know, and as it goes forward, we're going to definitely be using somewhat more inheritance, even though they may be still static. Uh, inheritance is nice because you can have something that's uh, a particular type of object and then make uh, modifications to it when you need to have special cases uh, and just basically subclass that object and add more methods to it which is very nice, um, as opposed to having what we typically had in Marlin, which is uh, if this, then include this bunch of code, and if this, then include this other bunch of code, otherwise leave it out. Um, that tends to be more messy and harder to maintain, and it spreads things around. We find that one feature ends up being, uh, you know, you need a piece in this file, and a piece in that file, and another piece in this file to support it, and it'd be nice if we can encapsulate them more. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll bring those together. And as far as um, how C++ has changed, uh, the parts I'm using are pretty much their standard and they have been for a while. I don't use templates, I don't use a lot of the, um, you know, the kinds of abstract features. I'm just trying to keep it, you really just take advantage of the little bits of syntactical sugar that C++ can add to your code and make it a little nicer uh, to read and to maintain. And so that's, that's how I feel about it. C++ stuff. Um, Country 3D asks, um, Prusa MK42 support, is it coming? Uh, the Orballo clone is a good heated bed, but it needs to implement the probing and skew corrections in Fords. So I believe at the time this was asked, maybe we didn't have skew correction in there. We now do. Um, we now have uh, a more robust um, filament runout detection and uh, filament change features and stuff. We are incorporating Trinamic uh, drivers, and you can now use TMC uh, 2130s, just like the uh, on the INZ Rambo, and um, the INZ Rambo board is now supported in Marlin, um, and it'll be there with 119. It's now in the bug fix or nightly build, um, but yeah, all that stuff is coming in. Um, the multiplexer actually is now supported. Uh, it took me a little while to get that together. Uh, when I first started it, it was just like, uh, it hadn't been released yet, so I hadn't had a chance to see how it would perform, but people are now actually able to use it and test it, and they've reported that you know it had issues, and so we fixed those, and so now it's actually uh, been pretty well tested. And so, uh, yeah, um, and the MK42, um, they're talking about the heated bed. I think actually there's all um, like multi-zone heated beds. That's something we haven't added yet, but that's something I want to get to pretty soon. Um, and then any other, there's a filament uh, jam detection, which we haven't got in there yet because we need to support certain peripherals for that. And so we need to get the specs on those peripherals and then basically also make sure, as with everything we do in Marlin, to make sure that it works not only with uh, a Cartesian that, or whatever tar platform it might have come from originally, but we got to support Delta. We got to make sure it works even with Scara, and um, and stuff like that. So, and yeah, we just basically have to make sure that everything works with as many platforms and as many machines as possible, and we have to implement it in a way that's, you know, as agnostic as possible for all of those, and or at least uh, you know, is customizable so that you can have it behave the way that you need it to for your particular type of printer. Um, and now, uh, one more. Bcar, are there any plans to integrate Trinamic Trams support in Marlin? And actually, yeah, we have um, code in there already that's waiting for trams to be ready. Uh, and the only thing missing is the, the if you're not familiar, uh, 
with what trams is it's the trinamic um, ramps style board where it's a basically it's a 3d printer board built around the trinamic drivers and it's built around the 5130 which has its own motion controller and so the real cool part about that is that you in your um, stepper routines instead of saying pulse 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 to move every single step of the stepper motor you just tell it go this far this fast and you know all these motors will coordinate their motions and do that and they'll even have you can tell it what kind of uh, acceleration curve to use and everything so you can you don't have to do any of the code to coordinate all the steppers they the stepper drivers or the motion controller part of the stepper drivers handles all that and so what that means is that even with a slow AVR 16 megahertz processor you now suddenly get like huge performance because you don't need to do all that extra stepping and the main firmware is really only saying you know go <laughs> and it just goes so uh, that's one of the cool things about that. So yeah, there are definite plans to get that in there. I've actually looked at the, the, the stepper part and the only tricky bit is that we may need to sacrifice certain parts of Marlin, uh, like um, we're using like junction deviation and other and jerk settings and so forth. And so we need to be able to tell the steppers um, like their starting speed and their ending speed and then uh, as far as acceleration and ramping, you know, learn how to control that and get it tuned the way that it will work best for um, uh, the features in Marlin and the, and the settings that are available. And you know, if uh, you know, these are meant to be used in motion control, so I assume that they have uh, all the sorts of things we would want. We actually have S ramping now as a feature. Um, it's called Bezier curve, Bezier jerk control, is the name of it. Uh, I guess we could call it S-curve, but um, we're calling it Bezier Jerk Control, and it basically uh, ramps the speed up in an S, so it starts out accelerating a little slower, and then as it decelerates or reaches speed, it, it slows down its acceleration. So there's the speedy part and then it's slower, so the net effect is that you end up with less of a shaking and less ringing and so-called ringing and other things that, um, and you're printer can go a little faster as a result, or its top speeds can be a bit higher. So that's part of what we want to do, and if uh, trams can support that even better, because it takes extra computation to do all that stuff, and so it would be nice to have that weight lifted and to be able to have that supportable on the 8-bit boards, and uh, with trams it definitely could be. The 5130s are awesome, but they are pricey, uh, so it's the only uh, disadvantage of, of the Trinamic trams is it's a little pricier, but uh, for the performance benefits, it's worth it. You might have to spend a lot more for a 32-bit board, uh, and still you may not get the, you know, you still, you're still everything's controlled about at the software level, so, uh, you know, this just guarantees better timing and so forth. Uh, from Twitter, uh, Evgeny Kotsuba asks, what about Telegram? Um, and uh, I don't know about Telegram. I, I think I looked it up the other day and I completely forget what it is. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> um, Peter Brown, will you be implementing power failure recovery in the new release? Yes, sort of. Uh, right now it has, um, we brought in, we got the firmware from Creality uh, 3D. Uh, they finally released it. Um, and it has a version of power failure recovery that remembers on every level, or I should say on every layer, every time the z-axis moves up past where it's been before, uh, it saves the current state of the machine. And so if you do lose power, it saves it on the SD card. Uh, so if you're doing an SD print, and it only does it this for SD printing, uh, then if it's interrupted by a power loss, it'll check when it reboots, see that file, and then it asks, do you want to continue? And it'll continue from the start of whatever layer it was on, which means it might repeat parts of the layer. If you were at the very end of a layer and it quit, you might have to do that entire layer again, which could mean the nozzle might run into the print. So there's issues with that. We want to have better support, which means catching the power loss at the moment that it happens and only saving when that happens. Uh, saving on every layer might be uh, also reducing the life of the SD card, so we want to make sure that you're not like writing to the SD card all the time. 
It also could slow down printing a little bit, uh, but since it's only on every layer change, that's typically when there's a pause anyway, so it's not a huge thing, but you would want to definitely have it so you have a particular power loss circuit that can detect the power loss and that maybe has some capacitors on it, so it gives you a little more time to um, you know, actually move the steppers away and maybe back off the extruder a little bit and make sure that you're not melting your print while it's, you know, while the power is out. And then when, and the power recovery though is the same for all these. It reads the SD card, says, oh, there's that file. And then it does a rehoming of X and Y. It moves X, uh, Z up a little bit and then comes over and can, tries to continue to print from where it left off. Uh, so uh, that's actually currently working. It could use some more testing. So I'm hoping to get that tested a little more before 119. And it uses a lot of RAM for this big buffer for the commands, so I want to figure out a way to not use the big buffer, but instead just read each command from the SD card, which would make the most sense, and just run each one instead. Um, so, and then at the end of the SD card uh, thing, it would continue from wherever it left off. Uh, and there are ways to do that. You could write, um, we could write straight G code to the SD card, which is like should you run out of power, just run this SD file and it'll continue to print from where it left off. Um, and so I'm hoping to make it better um, than what was originally provided by Creality 3D. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes, but it may not be perfect yet. Um, from Facebook, uh, Lucas Esteban Campa asks, will there be a menu editor tool, a GUI or web-based? Um, not at this time. Um, the menu is getting refined, That's especially for 2.0, there's a whole new layout. Uh, I've tried to do some tweaks, um, but yeah, the menu, menu editing is a little bit more involved. You need to have support functions for each item. It's not like you can just say, add a menu item that um, edits this value, unless it were already there and wait in waiting and could be just toggled on and off. That would be one way to have it. But then also arranging them in a certain order um, that, that would be an interesting thing to try, but it would basically be manipulating the code and moving the code around, and that's a little bit tricky from a programming perspective, so it hasn't been done yet. Uh, there is now a configuration tool called Marlin Config, or Marlin Conf, and it's uh, A-K-A-J-E-S is the name of the user on GitHub. So if you go to github.org or github.com slash A-K-A-J-E-S, uh, you'll find his project there, and that's getting better all the time. It doesn't allow editing of menus per se, but you can tweak an awful lot of settings and it gives guidance and connects to the uh, Marlin website to show you the documentation at the same time. So it's really handy for um, tweaking all the kinds of settings that you might not want to get into normally. Uh, you can play around with them a little more with this. And also it should have the ability um, as it grows to migrate from older to newer versions Marlin without having to rewrite the file yourself or examine it carefully with a magnifying glass to make sure you get every feature. So uh, helpful uh, features to make configuration better and easier uh, are coming along. Uh, and finally, last question from Ahmed Torres Medina on Facebook. Will there be rehoming on lost steps for TMC 2130 drivers? And uh, actually, we've just started working on that and discussing it, really. So uh, there won't be in 119 unless someone like whips together something and it's awesome. Uh, there's some issues with the, just the libraries that are being worked out and trying to make them better. Um, but I, certainly for 2.0 or 2.1, which will come shortly after 2.0, kind of like um, 2.0 will be the 32, not just the 32-bit release, but the unified release. You'll be able to take, right now you can take Marlin 2.0 and you can build in Arduino IDE for AVR for your standard, you know, at mega boards and your standard ramps boards um, and all the stuff you already build for. But you can also use, you can also open up Marlin in platform IO and then build from there. And then it also offers the ability to build for all the 32-bit platforms that are common out there now. Um, things like your smoothie board and your MKS SACs and things like that. Um, and your do and so forth um, can all be built from uh, from platform IO and I think uh, actually Arduino do can actually be built from 
just from the Arduino IDE, so you don't necessarily need to jump into Platform I.O. if you're just using a do. Um, but yeah, among the other features that are coming along is yeah, lost steps for tw TMC2130 drivers, um, and just we want to be able to handle that well um, and respond to it. Of course, every new feature we add adds a little bit of overhead uh, for checking that sort of stuff, but with uh, things like end stop interrupts, we can hopefully mitigate that and make things um, not, you know, uh, cost a lot of performance. Ooh, it's time to muddle on. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's as much AMA as I have right now. Um, so I'll just wrap this up. It's a bit of a longer video, but um, hopefully we'll get more questions next time. Or, um, but uh, keep an eye out. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, yeah, again at the uh, East Coast Rep Rap Festival, which is coming up uh, in June, I believe June 20th, um, right around the, the summer, uh, is it solstice? Uh, so, a uh, really great time, uh, or is it winter solstice? Well, anyway, it's at that, that it's the longest day of the year. <laughs> I'll be there, and uh, it's going to be a really good time, uh, and I'm putting together my talk, and I hope to cover some really cool things um, and just basically give a little overview and a little retrospective on what's been going on the last uh, few years and uh, and take a look again at what's going on in RepRap. So I look forward to seeing you there and uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, thanks for uh, stopping by. Be sure to like, share, subscribe. Uh, you can support me, me on Patreon if you, uh, if you like Marlin, you like what it does and you want to see more of uh, of that and you want to see more content related to Marlin, uh, I'm going to try and put more together. Uh, but I'm, I'm a little camera shy, so I'm just getting used to this. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll see you soon.